can everybody hear me at the back? Very good. So, uh, as we've said, I'm going to talk to you today about the, the new Whittle Lab, and I'm going to talk to you about our goal of decarbonising the propulsion and power sectors. And uh, the talk can really be summed up in one idea, and this is injecting pace and simplicity into UK technology transfer. So, as many of you I'm sure are aware, the pressure of decarbonisation of both the power and propulsion sectors is resulting in the sectors going through transformational change. So I'm sure a lot of you are aware that Rolls-Royce is developing the Ultrafan engine, which is on the left there, and this has the aim of a 25% fuel reduction by 2025. Now, when Rolls-Royce uh, developed their last major architecture change of engine, the RB211 in the 70s, it ended up bankrupting the company. And when Rolls-Royce went through that transformation, it had a very strong internal research department. And now its research departments are its university technology centres, such as the Wedge Lab. So we've been as, as busier than ever. Now, many people don't know that another transformational change is going on in companies like Rolls Royce. And, and that is the impact of machine learning and high performance computing on the design systems. So, typical design systems will take hundreds of designers. Uh, working on different aspects of a problem. And those designers may well um, change the geometry of blades, run computational codes or run experimental rigs and see the consequences. But machine learning systems and high performance computing are coming in to sort of augment the experience of those designers and that that's causing another revolutionary change. Uh, another transformation in the sector that I'm sure you're aware of is the impact of electrification. Now, at the small end of aviation, uh, the aircraft are about 6% weight on takeoff of fuel. So it's relatively straightforward to move from um, hydrocarbon fuels to batteries on small aircraft. And you can see the effect of this. This is counts of development program against year. And when I took this graph, we were on about 60 programs that were planning a first flight of an electric urban air taxi by 2024. This is now up to about 200 globally. There's a complete gold rush going on. Now, they're interesting, but not hugely environmental. But the technology involved in those projects are starting to feed into larger projects. So you can see here um, Singapore's Element 1 aircraft, which is planning a first flight in 2025. And that's zero carbon, and it uses hydrogen fuel cells to run a series of electrical propellers along the way. And you can see that the fuel cells are a higher power density the batteries. Now if we go to larger aviation, the chance of removing gas turbines is very unlikely with current technologies. Um, but uh, there are other ways of massively cutting the emissions from aircraft. You can see here the silent aircraft that Dayman Dowling developed in Cambridge. It was a Cambridge, MIT, Boeing, Rolls-Royce, joint project funded by the government, and they developed this uh, flying wing aircraft. Now this aircraft was designed to uh, be below the background noise level at the boundaries of an airport, but the consequence of shielding the propulsion systems and integrating them into the main body of the aircraft resulted in about a 20% to 25% reduction in fuel burn. And NASA N plus 3 program took this on a stage further. N is the current generation, and plus 3 is three generations into the future. And they refocused this sort of work towards lowering fuel burn. And their program was claiming 70% reductions were possible. So very large reductions can be, can be got from conventional gas turbine technologies. 
Now, nearer term, this is um, a sort of 737 replacement, and this is being developed in the Whittle Lab as part of the European Centreline project. You can see the similar technologies. These are boundary layer ingestion engines. The, 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 the slow fluid on the top of the aircraft is being sucked into the engines and re energised. The same thing is happening here. The slow fluid down the fuselage is coming in and being accelerated by an electrical propulsor that's fitted to the tail. Uh, by the way, the centerline project is aiming at about 11% fuel reduction. So you can see how the stepping stones of technology, this will be relatively easy to start to integrate into the current sort of air transport system, whereas uh, aircraft flows are much more difficult. Now, in terms of uh, land-based power, there's also transformation and change going on. So, uh, the Whittle Lab is doing a lot of work on wind turbines, a lot of work on tidal turbines, that's extracting energy from the Earth's tides. And the great thing actually about tidal, extracting energy from tides, is that they're predictable. You can say, sort of, on a Tuesday in 2,000 years' time, at half past seven, that's the energy I'm going to get from the system, which is not true of wind or solar. Uh, the tidal turbines also have the benefit of a higher power density, so a much smaller unit can produce more power. The difficulty with them is that they're operating with a, a thrust on them, which is about the same as the fan of a turbofan engine at takeoff. And they have to operate for sort of 30 years in that sort of environment. And the sea is incredibly unsteady. Uh, this is a, a prediction done at the Whittle Lab. This is the turbine, and you can see the vorticity from, from, from the tip vortex. This is sort of side view, and this is a front view. And you can see here, this is in unsteady sea conditions, and you can see the waviness. Of, of the vortices being checked. And that is literally a graphical interpretation of the unsteady load on the blades. And we've been looking at ways of reducing that load to extend life significantly. Another area we're working on in the Whittle Lab are um, turbines for power extraction from low grade heat. So if you've got industrial processes where you have heat that at the moment is thrown away, or you have very large solar plants, you, you have heat that's coming from a source which is at not very high temperatures. And for that, you need turbines that run on different fluids. fluids. And the turbines are called organic ranking cycles, and you can see some of the predictions of those turbines there. And they're really interesting, actually, because um, the properties of, of these fluids are very strange. So the way we design blades for these environments to operate efficiently is quite challenging. Another transformational change in the sector is compounding of engines, from cars to trains to ships. There's far more going on. The number of turbochargers in cars has rapidly risen. It used to be sporty cars, now it's in virtually every car. And electrical compounding, the taking off of power from the turbine and the engine electrically allows you to do much cleverer things with the engine. And the amount of work going to the Whittle Lab on turbochargers is massively ramped up as well. Mitsubishi is a big sponsor of the lab for about 40 years. Um, if we're going to get a larger penetration of renewables, a significantly larger penetration of renewables into the grid, we need to have standby power which will switch on much more quickly than conventional gas turbines. And we need to migrate those gas turbines over to hydrogen. And Mitsubishi did lots of work on this, uh, so that's a real challenge. Siemens. Siemens UK is the old Rustons up at Lincoln. Um, very, the first people really in the small gas turbine business, Bob Fielder. Bob Field, and he moved from Weddell's original team, he was a chief engineer, and kicked off to the Rustons. Rustons now seen as UK and developed small gas turbines for standby power. Again, they're finding very large markets 
in micro grids where you have to have standby power that will switch on quickly. And what they've told us is that there's very bespoke industrial solutions for different sites. And if they can produce, if they can develop a new engine in about a third of the time they currently do, they can double the market, their, their market sort of set to capture globally. So there's massive benefits for UK jobs if, if they can react more quickly to develop new machines. James Dyson is a big sponsor of the lab. Um, James uh, came over about seven years ago. We were lucky because Rittles is a big hero. Um, and he's got some real interesting challenges in turbo machines. This is not decarbonisation, but um, he will, they will, his team will be thinking of a product and they need to know whether a turbo machine will work in that product within sort of days to know whether to continue with the product or not. And Rolls Royce will typically take months or years to develop a new product. So he needs to know much more quickly. For instance, on his hair dryer, there's a turbo machine in the, in the handle. And the, the, the design choice had to be, could he get the power at low enough noise in a small person's hand circumference? So it's an incredibly interesting design requirement for that. Now, these machines are operating at a tick Mach number, so the sort of velocity relative to speed of sound, of 0.7. They're up at the gas turbine level of power density, but their Reynolds number the sort of viscous processes are closer to insects. And as you know, insects have flat plates for their wings. So it's a really challenging design space in which to work. So hopefully you can see that in all these areas, this massive transformational change is occurring. And as a lab, the little lab needs to react to that change, to that sudden market shift. So we've been working for a number of years on how we can respond to that change. And the first solution is the ability to ask bigger questions. So companies are coming to us and are saying, they used to say things like, can you design a better compressor? And they're now coming to us and saying, at what scale should we go electric? Or they're saying, is what should we use to power a zero emission regional jet? Or uh, we want to link together batteries and, guide, guide, uh, and, and gas turbines as a hybrid power unit. How do we do that and at what scale does it work? Tidal turbines, you know, the unsteadiness in the ocean is really tough. What site should we use? What unsteadiness can we tolerate? How can we design the base to alleviate over life? These are big, big, multidisciplinary questions. And very like Andowering, how you, in the science aircraft, how you make an aircraft silent beyond the boundaries of, of, of an airport. And so what we've done here is we've decided that the next generation of Little Lab needs a capability to ask these questions. And to ask these questions, what Andowering showed was you need to bring together multidisciplinary groups from across the university from across different universities and across industries and you need to co-locate them at a scale of about 20, 30 people for fixed periods of time to tackle very definite problems. So that's one of the things you'll see later in that new lab. The second solution that we think industry needs during this transformational change is summed up in this graph which we put to government, this schematic. So this is goodness of product, and this is time. And this is Whittle invents the jet engine, and we're on this line, and we're say somewhere here now, we're still improving the jet engine, but, but, it, but it's, it's, sort of, um, it's a sort of asymptotic line. Then we move to uh, carbon reducing technologies, things like band of air ingestion engines, types of energy and we move up this line and then we go for zero carbon and we move up another line. Now you notice in the blue lines there's a time constant and the time constant is about 10 years. 
And that results from the way the aerospace sector develops technology. It uses the technology readiness levels that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that generally involves a PhD at a university or a fundamental research institute leading on to a technology transfer program, leading on to a demonstrator, leading on to an engine program, and most technologies will take about 10 years to go through that process, maybe six if you're lucky. So we ask the question, what would happen? How do we wrap this up more quickly? If we're going to decarbonise uh, the world's power propulsion sector, we can't be waiting on those timescales. So we set ourselves the task of achieving, to start with about a, a ten times reduction in the time and cost of innovating new technologies, and we've sort of ramped that up to about a hundred times. And I'll show you today how we're doing that. And if you can do that, you move on to the red line, so you ramp up more quickly, but also you can test out more things, you can fail more often, and that means you can get to a higher asymptote. And, and we honestly believe, what we argue to government, that the winners in this new world will be companies who can adapt to these technology chains or shifts more quickly. Now, Say you're going to do something 10 times faster or 100 times faster, see if I go to fantasy. So, how, how do we go about that? Well, the basic principle is to merge the digital and physical systems involved in the technology development process. So, typically, a technology development process will be you have an idea and you design it into a component. You then make that component, uh, you test that component, and you feed back your understanding to be able to go around the loop again. Now, in Lab, we're pretty good at that. In 2005, we had four compressor technologies which were being taken around this loop, and it took us two years, about six months of technology to get around this loop. Uh, so we set about improving each one of these three, and I'll say in a minute about how we did that. And then that took us about five years of developing technology, our ways of doing it, honing it down. And then we did a formalised trial with Rolls-Royce, funded by the Aerospace Technology Institute. And we took two technologies from Derby, from Rolls, one technology from Rolls-Royce Corporation in the US, and one technology from the Whittle Lab, we assembled a small team in the Whittle Lab and we got them around this new technology loop. And we took four technologies around the loop in under a week, which is about a hundred times faster. So let me tell you a little bit, uh, well, before I tell you a little bit about it, uh, there's, there's an interesting parallel here. So I'm sure many of you have heard of what they call Industry 4.0 came out of Germany. And the idea of Industry 4.0 is, is, is the first industrial revolution involved us sort of making the machines, a mechanisation, water power, steam power. And then the second industrial revolution was mass production and assembly. The third was computer design and automation of production lines. And the final one, which we're going through at the moment, is arguing to, is to be the merging of the physical and digital worlds. So the digital world and the physical world communicating seamlessly. Now, I would argue there's an exact parallel with aerospace technology development. So, the first generation was literally wicked building engines and testing them. We then opened labs like NACA and NGTE labs. And they had teams of hundreds of people testing cascades, turbines, different configurations and learning. The third generation, in the late 80s and 90s, in the late 80s and 90s, was the computerization. This is CFD coming in, computational fluid dynamics, and a lot of rigs are decommissioned, and people move over to numerical solutions. What we're finding at the moment is that the physical and digital systems in the design process are changing. So we're finding that we've speeded up uh, 
the physical way it takes place so quickly and merged it with the digital uh, modeling that Rolls Royce are testing things before they even predict them. So, how do we do this? Well, we have these three elements, and I'm going to take you around how we reduce the time by a factor of 100. We aim for 10, but we ended up with 100 in each of the three, and that results in us getting around the loop 100 times faster. So, the first one is design. So, if you design your blade, a typical way to do it in virtually any industrial design system is to move geometry and look at the consequences. So, you'll say, oh, put a bit of camber in there, or re stagger. And these are all things that have a time constant to see a result. So, what we did is we looked at the aerodynamic challenges the designers were having, and we encoded a system where the design system would move the geometry thousands of times in the background to achieve the aerodynamic aims that the designer was, 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 was aiming for. And that immediately speeded things up by at least a factor of 100. We then, uh, to run the CFD faster, we use a CFD that runs on graphics processors. So these are the, these are the processors that are used by the game industry. You, you trick these, these computer cards that think they're rendering computer graphics into solving the Navier Stokes equations, and they'll do it about 100 times faster. So that's going to be incredibly useful. And then AI, machine learning, is starting to come in. So if you're doing thousands and thousands of designs, it's likely that the machine will say, well, that's quite a good guess to start with. You don't really want to start from where you think you want to start. Try over there. And, and overall, this is at least 100 times reduction in our design time. Manufacture. So you've got, you've got to make, a designer sitting there, clever design, how do they make it? Well, um, 3D printing is great, we do a lot of that. But actually, rapid machining is what most, most of the stuff we use. The big breakthroughs have been moving the machine in-house and coupling it directly to the design system. So the design system puts out cutter tools, files. So you literally, you say, I've got a design, realise it in the physical world, and eight hours later, there is a blade set waiting for you to put it in the rig. Um, other tricks, we've been through the whole manufacture process. You'll see here on this five-axis machine, um, there are eight blades locked in. You notice they're all in blocks before, so we've pre-prepared blocks for root fixing, stacks and stacks and stacks of them, so that doesn't have to be done beforehand. Because we lock them into the machine tool with the same fixing as the rig, with the same torque setting, you don't have to cut the tips, so you don't have to take the rotor disc off to get the tip clearances right. There are all sorts of tricks like that that cut massive amounts of time. And again, about eight hours now to get a complete blade set from when you decide you want it. Testing. So what we did here was we did a value stream analysis, which is what production line people you analyse every single process you go through in testing a rig, you then sort of flip that and you look at the value it offers to the testing process. And we found we could remove about 95% of operations from the design, from, from the testing process. So I'll give you one example here. Uh, this is a row of stationary stator blades, um, and upstream is a row of rotor blades. Now, to change those blades, normally you take the rig apart, take the rotor disc off, and take the blades out. That involves taking the traverse out. That involves recalibrating the probe system. That involves rebalancing the rotor disc when it goes back on. These are all things that take a lot of time. In this setup, you, you slacken off two bolts and you pull out part of the annulus and you put in another part. So, it's all tricks like this, which when you add them up, well, we're at least, I think we're about a thousand times faster now, and I'll show you some of that later. Now, if you've got this capability, you need to work differently. You can't be, use top-down management. You can't use uh, deliverables, milestones. You can't plan things in advance. What you need are semi-autonomous uh, technology development teams. 
which are co-located industry and academics together, and they're given the freedom to do what they want, to achieve a specific goal. Now, this, this chap here, Tony Dickens, uh, is an interesting story. So about five years ago, when I actually started developing this way of working, or thinking about it, I went for a drink with Tony, and at the time, Tony was an aerodynamic tester at Red Bull Formula One. And he uh, said um, to me, we were over a pint, and he said, oh, Rob, what, what are you doing at the moment? And I said, well, we just developed the second generation of 3D compressor plates for rolls. Uh, like how much performance improvement they'd be. He said, oh, that's, that's brilliant. I really understand the physics. It's great. When will they make energy? And I said, maybe six years. We're lucky. And then I said, well, what are you doing today, Tony? And he said, oh, we tested um, 20 components on the rear wing in the winter. It was a Thursday. Uh, we fitted a surface through the results, which predicted the best. We tested it, it was the best. I haven't got a clue why. I just emailed it to track. By track, there's a bunch of printers. It'll be on the car for practice tomorrow. And at that moment, you know, the pen dropped. You know, what are we doing? And aerospace is much more difficult than Formula One, as I'm sure you all know. But uh, we applied for funding from the, from the Aerospace Technology Institute. Tony left Red Bull and joined us as our, as our Chief Technology Transfer Engineer, and he's driven a lot of this through. Uh, this diagram here shows sort of what his, his view of how we form the teams. So we'll have an idea, and uh, this idea will form a team around it, and it might be a series of RAs, research assistants from the university, and some Rolls Royce members who have access to PIs, uh, university academics, and it'll be formed for a fixed amount of time to take on a specific challenge. And this shows one of the tech transfer teams. They've got Chris Hall, who's one of the chief compressor designers at Rolls Royce, Tony, Poan, um, all working on a particular technology to do with compressor teams. Uh, there's another good story, so I can extract these stories. But another good story here. So we, we set all this up and we told different departments and roles, and um, Rolls Royce US, Rolls Royce Corporation, sent a technology in and said, Could you test it? And we said, Yeah, we tested it, and sent it back, which actually worked really well. And then Rolls Royce Derby got in touch and said, We haven't followed the innovation process, and it should go through Derby before we do the testing. And it just shows you, I mean, they immediately understood what they were saying, it was silly, but, but it just shows you that. The, the standard procedures that are put in place in these large companies to try and promote innovation quite often get in the way of these small teams taking good ideas and running. Okay, now I thought I'd show you two examples of how this has had impact. Uh, there's nothing better than a sort of a real example. The first one, this is a cut through a compressor. There's an inlet guide vein that puts a bit of swirl in, a bit of rotation, and then there's a rotor rotates and a staging, stationary blade row. And one of the questions that still unanswered or was before this program was how many blades should you put in a row? If you run CFD, computer models, it tells you to take out about 20% of the blades. And if you do that, the aircraft will stall, the compressor won't run. So you need experiments to do it. And people were using tests that were done in NACA in the 50s to decide on the blade number because it was real data. The second one is how much 3D to put in. You know, should be a lot of 3D and a little bit of 3D. We weren't quite sure about that because again, the computation doesn't get that right. So we did a test where we thought, well, we've got this capability, testing in one to two days. Why don't we merge together around 200 computational solutions, 30 full compressor stages with different blade numbers, different 3D levels, and just find out the answer. This was done by James Taylor, who's a PhD student at the West one time. So, great study, going well, and then this result happened. So, this is a measurement behind the stator, and this is the computation. And this is when the machine is throttled, so it's near its operating limit, it's about to stall. And 
The, we traverse the flow, and you can see here, this is a high loss region behind the blade, and this is a high loss region behind the next blade, behind the two stasis. And you can see that there's a big high loss region in the casing of the experiment. That's the flow has literally come off the surface, it's separated. And in the CFD, it's completely the wrong wall has failed, the hub has failed. So the computer models are telling us that not only is it wrong, but it's getting the wrong wall failing, and in a completely different mechanism. That, that sort of shocked us. So we asked everybody to think of, nobody had a clue, so we thought, right, rapid testing, we're going to test everything. So we roughened the blades to see if that had an effect. We tried different blade geometries, we printed slight variations, didn't have an effect. We tried changing the leakage under the stator, so it's the, the, the artificial leakage, the rotor clearance we changed. Nothing changed that failure. So then we thought, well, the computation is wrong. So we ran all the turbulence models we could. We changed transition from laminar to turbulent in all sorts of locations. We changed leakage flows, we ran it unsteady, steady. Nothing changed the computation. So can anybody in the audience tell me what the cause of that difference is? Any ideas? No? Well, let me show you. So we were predicting these two rotor blades, the rotor and the stator. And in this region of the rotor, the rotor tip flow, where the leakage came over, was predicting the flow angle wrong by two degrees. Two degrees. When we solved the stator alone in the computer model, correcting that two degrees, it flipped. That's astonishing. Now, in a real engine, you'll only know the flow in the end walls to make 10 degrees. And two degrees would do that. I know I'm really astonished. So, so here's the profile. This is at the rotor. This is the experiment profile of angle. Angle versus radius, casing, hub, the black. And the red was, was the computer model. Two degrees. So we thought, well, this is really interesting. So we designed a profile. And we put a variation of two degrees into both walls because that's where the unknown flow is in a real machine. And we ran 10,000 solutions and we looked at the whole design space. And what we found was really interesting. So, whole half of the design space where blades were 2D, quite straight, or just slightly 3D, slightly sort of bent over. At this behaviour. So this behaviour is, this is the, the loss in the blade. Up is bad, down is good. And this is the angle along the bottom. So this is design angle, and then you increase the angle onto the blade, and you follow the red line, and the loss rises, 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 and then suddenly the flow collapses. With the little variations I showed you on the last one, it caused a variation in the failing mechanism of half the operating range. Which is unbelievable. And that's the way all blades were in jet engines up to the year 2000. Now the new 3D blades that came in that were developed at the Whiffle Lab came into all Rolls-Royce engines about the year 2000. These behaved like this. So that they didn't have this sharp jump. And they have very small variation. So what you can see here, what I'm trying to show you, is that by merging of the physical and digital worlds and allowing yourself to test very quickly lots of combinations, you, 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 this rapid technology development capability allows an unparalleled physical understanding of the design space that we've never had before. It's quite remarkable what it allows us to know. Okay, so that's generation one. So we thought this is powerful. Generation two, generation three, each time generation four, each time we were holding down the speed it took to do tests. So for generation four, where we are at the moment, we're down to 15 minutes to strip 
rebuild and test the compressor stage. And this is uh, how we do it. This is our industry academic sort of pit team working on the facility. Um, so you've got uh, Harry Simpson, who's a, 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 a Rolls Royce, uh, by the way, health and safety. I don't know who's watching here. There, there is a, a barrier at the background on this. Uh, Harry Simpson is a compressor designer at Rolls Royce. Bryce Conduit is one of the young stars in machine learning at Rolls Royce. Uh, and this is James Taylor, who's a, a research fellow at King's. And, and, and they're working together as a pit crew, coming up with concepts, changing them. And we started to think, well, hey, if we, if we can get a test done every 15 minutes, could we populate a machine learning system with real data rather than computational data? What sort of problems could we start to tackle that we couldn't before? So we got together a team. These are a series of different people from Rolls-Royce and, and the Whittle. And we looked through different problems and we came up with this really interesting problem. And it's a, a damaged compressor blade problem. So the problem is that when, every so often when aircraft's going to land, they'll go through standard checks. So a camera is put into the engine and they'll look for cracks. And if they see a crack, they will send in a little robot and they'll machine an arc to crack out to make the blade, blade structurally sound. And these are the arcs they cut out. Now they're structurally sound, but are they aerodynamically sound to take off? Now we know if one's cut off, we're safe. But what happens if somewhere in say Singapore, they, they, they open it up, they cut the arc off, and there's five more arcs cut off that road? When can you not take off? And the way companies do this at the moment is they send back the damaged blade pattern to Darwin or to their home, wherever, whichever engine manufacturer they are, and a chief designer makes the decision, a concession, about whether to fly or not. And it's an incredibly stressful thing to do, and they always play very safe in that, in that environment. Now, if an engine has to come off the wing as an unplanned engine off, it's about half a million dollars of cost. So that's a big problem. So we thought, well, designers aren't very good at making this call. So how about we develop a machine learning system populated with rapid testing and able us to predict, that's the undamaged compressor, pressure rise and flow, what, what the damaged compressor would do. Can we do it better than a designer? <laughs> the new method must be accurate. Unplanned engine removals are expensive. It must be fast. Service engineers need to instantly sentence. So this would be used to support a choice of a human designer. It wouldn't be used to replace the human. So uh, this is an example. So we these are different cutoffs. So 5% of core, 10%, 30%, 50%. These are the sort of cutoffs they do. We went further because we wanted the machine learning system to go past what they actually do, so it would predict accurately to the edge of the space. Um, and so these, this is our compressor. Uh, this is 125 rotors tested. This is when we when we published this data, uh, the reviewers couldn't believe it was possible. Test 125 rotors. This would have been six months of rotor before we did this. And uh, you see, this is the pressure rise and the flow. This is the good compressor, high pressure rise, good range, and these are the bad compressors. How did we pick those compressors? Well, uh, we wanted to have a wide range of covering of all future issues. We wanted them to be representative of real service damage, so we were taking them off production lines, off, off in-service lines. We wanted to focus them near the sentencing limit, so the limit was accurately predicted. And then we wanted the machine learning system to tell us where it was uncertain, so it could fit in points for us, which I think is interesting. So this is the sort of thing we got. This is a damage 
fraction, and this is 0 to 360 degrees round rotor. So this has got a 10% damage blade there, a 10% damage blade there, a 30% ones there, 10% and 5%. And uh, we, uh, we have 125 points, and really, if you're going to train a machine learning system for this sort of problem, you really need more like 10,000 points to populate that system. So we had to build into it some experience. So we took all the chief designers who do this for a job, and we took all the most experienced academics who understand the flow dynamics, and we got them to sort of play a game. You know, is this compressor good? Is this compressor bad? And from that, we learned a set of basics functions. We learned a set of things that the designers look for. And the designers look for things like the mean damage, the maximum damage, the greatest fraction of damage in a 40 degree sector. And there are all these things that they looked out for. And then we took the damage set, so this is the damage set, and I'll just show you how we did one of them. We took the 60 degree damage sector and we slid it along, multiplying it by the damage. And you see here, this is the 60% sector. There's a 10% damage there and a 5% damage. So that would be a 15 score of damage. And then you slide it along, and this is the worst damage. When you add up all of these, you get to 120. So we, we took all those damage profiles, we took it through this wisdom that the designers were doing, and then we inputted those, those basis functions into our machine learning model standard schematic for machine learning model. And this was the result. Uh, this is just four cases shown at random. The dots are the experimental measurements and the solid lines are the prediction from the machine learning system. The lines show where the machine learning system say they are stored. And we found the system was at 98% accurate to a 95% this, this is quite an amazing conclusion. So that's really interesting because rapid technology development again has, has got us into a totally new area. We didn't realise that at the time, but it now enables us to develop machine learning models which can do things that humans can't do in the in-service world, which is, which is sort of astonishing. Okay, so we come up with this technology and we wanted to scale this to a lot more problems. If we're going to sort of use this rapid technology development system um, to decarbonize propulsion and power sector, we need to scale it to, to, to far wider range of tests than just compressors and turbines. So, uh, over about two years, uh, we worked with a range of our industries to develop what their need was in the future. And this is plotted, we've got this in a sort of multi-dimensional space, but I've plotted this here in two dimensions to simplify it. This is sort of pressure ratio of an aerodynamic model, and this is mass flow. And I've got all sorts of things here, from low pressure turbines to ultrafan, this is the heat exchanger, um, from the Sable engine, uh, this is a lift fan from Urban Air Taxi, this is a silent aircraft. Now, you'll notice there's a line down here, and that's our current with all that capability that was put in in the 1970s. And that's getting us sort of nowhere into this range, or very little. So we worked out that if we could go up to about 4 megawatts, we could get about 80% of these requirements. So that's the sort of scale we went to. So how does this compare with the competition? Well, we also had looked at facilities all over the world to see what they were doing. And you can see on here, blue is our current metal lab, and orange is our proposed facility. And there's two points, there's the purple points and the green region, which are our other alternative test facilities. Now, the, the purple points are high-speed test facilities around the world. 
And you'll notice the major problem with these, and that's flexibility. These have been designed to test particular configurations of compressor or turbine or inlet. And if you go to that research lab and you say, oh, that's nice, can I go over there? They'll say, well, yeah, that's um, sort of four to five million euros and a, a five year research project from their government or the EU. And that's, that, that is a real sort of disability for industry to be able to move. So we really need to be able to move in that space. The second one is this green region. And this is the existing low speed propulsion integration rate. So if you decide you're going to build an air taxi or a silent aircraft, you build your propulsor into the airframe and then you take it to a big atmospheric tunnel and you test it at a reasonable Reynolds number. Now, the, the cost and the time in those facilities we found scaled on model size. So because the models were big to get the round stuff right, the tunnel had to be big. Because the tunnel had to be big, it had to have a lot of staff. It took a long time to get in. You had to book it in advance. It was very expensive. If you made a mistake during your testing, you had to wait for another slot six months later. These are all problems that are facing companies like Rolls-Royce all the time. So we wanted to get around this problem as well. So this is our uh, test facility that um, uh, Dr. Nick Atkins has been developing for the last two years. Um, it's got an incredibly flexible compressor station, which allows us to move over most of the map you've seen. It's going to start with two test facilities, but it has extra exits, so that you can put on the sort of unknown and knowns as they arise. Now the first one is for um, integrated propulsion airframe problems. And what we found there, if you want to speed them up, your models need to be smaller. But reducing the size of a model lowers the Reynolds number, which makes them incorrect. So you need to pressurise them. And we've been working, we've been using pressurised tunnels at the Whipple since the 70s. And by going up between four and eight bar, we can get the very large model size down, a reasonable Reynolds numbers, down to sizes where you can make them in with rapid machining technology or 3D printing. So you can very quickly make the models. And because of that size difference, you might decide, I want to test 10 configurations or 20 or 30. I want to look at the whole design space. So you would be coming to us with lots of models, not just one big model. On, the, on rotating, Rapid testing, it's very like the stuff you saw earlier, it's just compressors, turbines, fans, but it's in, a, it's in a pressurized environment, which means you can put in your technology, your new technology into the compressor, 10 15 minutes. You can test it, but now you can cycle it through Reynolds and Mac number to see what it does at energy conditions, which allows you to de risk technologies really early in the program. So they're the first two facilities. As part of putting together this government research proposal to, for, this, for this new facility, uh, we had to map UK turbine machinery. And this was really interesting, actually, because that, what, there's a whole sector here which the government doesn't really talk about or doesn't really know exists. And people know it's all about Rolls Royce or Airbus, but in the turbine machinery sector, you've got Dyson. So we've got lots of turbine designers, impressive designers. You've got people like Napier in the turbocharger world for hybrid air vehicles, Cummings. You've got people like Safran UK who are building the cells. I want you to know how they interact with the fans. And this community actually is much bigger than we thought that needs support. So, so that, that was a, an interesting one. And what the new Wittle Lab wants to do is lower the barrier to entry. If you're doing tests faster and cheaper, then medium-sized companies can start coming in and working with you. At the moment, the cost of technology development in aerospace really keeps out the middle-sized players. So, so that's a real opportunity for the UK. We have to show to the government that we're in the right place to do it, and uh, you, uh, 
the Whittle Adam that has over 40 years of partnership, in fact it's 50 years with Rolls Royce, about 40 years with Mitsubishi, Siemens, and about seven years with Dyson. Um, interesting statistics actually, when we were doing it, 30% of the entire engineering partners' industrial income comes through the Whittle Lab, and 9% of the total university of industrial income comes through the Whittle Lab, which we didn't realise it was so large. Um, now, doing industrial research, we find, makes us academically much better than if we did some theoretical research. And, and I think that's proven in terms of our track record of winning awards. Uh, the, the, the most important award in the field uh, that's given once a year is the Gas Turbine Award by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. It's given once a year for the best piece of research since 1963, published research. And the Wittle Lab has won that nine years out of the last 13, which I think MIT's won it once during that period, and um, I think Germany has won it once. Um, so what is the new Wittle Lab and, and, and where's it going to go? So this is Manning Road, and this is JJ Thompson Avenue. And this is grass at the moment outside the lab. And you, you sort of drive in around the corner and you, you go down between the test halls, and there's a big courtyard here. And one of Rolls Royce's requirements for the lab was that we don't shut down the testing. We're going to build this out the front and then we're going to knock down the courtyards afterwards, move across. So I'm going to show you a, a cut through this new building. So this is the new Wittle Lab. These are the offices. We're going to have the, the um, uh, if you ever even visited the Wittle Lab, then you'll know the tea table is one of the most important parts of the lab, and that's the core writing centre. Um, we're going to have this propulsion and power challenge stage. You know I said right at the start, the industry wants us to answer big problems. This is based on a sort of model of and silent aircraft. We've got this space, it's going to be visible from the outside, and it's going to be a space where we can bring together these multidisciplinary groups with industry to take on these big challenges. Workshops sit between the halls and the test space. We've got a main space at the top, which is like a normal workshop. But actually, what we found is we need like a production line produce these geometries much faster. So we've got a, a sort of a productionized test floor at the bottom, which has got very large new five axis machining capability, which will allow us to things like make the whole blade of discs overnight. And then finally, we've got the test facility. And this test facility, as we said, is, is aimed to scale this rapid test about 80% of the UK's need and allow small and medium sized companies to get into the building and you'll see a range of things that we'll be able to test there. Funding. So, the actual test facility where well, we were successful with the government proposal, so we've got 13.5 million from the government and 10 million from Rolls Royce, Siemens and Dyson towards the project, and that will fund the actual test facility, but the actual Whittle Lab, new Whittle Lab offices, we're still fundraising. So please, we need your help. Oh. So please, we need your help in raising this remaining funding. So if you want to get involved in this journey, please, please come up afterwards. I've got some more information about it. <coughs> okay, so to end, I would argue with the new Whittle Lab, we are doing what Cambridge has always done. This, this photograph is the Whittle Lab in 1973 at the opening ceremony, and you've got Frank Whittle, so Stanley Hooker, from Rolls Royce, not much of an engineer, great, one of the great engineering autographies. Sir John Horlock, who opened the lab, wrote, wrote all key texts on the subject. Uh, Sir William Hawthorne, who uh, was, uh, developed 
stuff in Muscle Chain, I went to the Sanji and Master of Churchill, and Bob Fielden, I talked about earlier, who really is responsible for Rustin's and that whole turn machinery history in Lincoln. And what these four industrial academics, the five industrial academics, were doing together was facing the challenge of making the dream of mass air travel a reality. They were taking a technology which had started to be developed and they wanted to develop the technologies which would make it open to the masses to travel. And I would argue that we believe in the Wettel Lab, uh, that the new Wettel Lab will ensure that Cambridge and its industrial partners will lead the challenge of decarbonising the world's propulsion of cancer. 